Committee. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody to Geriatric Grand Rounds. Good to see everybody this morning. Um, just a few announcements before we get into today's presentation. Um, our next Grand Rounds will be October 7th. So please join for that. The speaker is Dr. Karina Drake in Geriatric Psychiatry. Our next journal club will be October 14th, and that will be led by Drs. Thomas Johnson and Carrie Hornet. Other announcements, um, after Grand Rounds today, you will get an email with a link um, to the recording of today's presentation and a copy of slides. There will also be a link to an online evaluation, so if you could please take a moment to fill that out, that's very helpful for us and the speakers. Um, please submit questions in the chat or Q&A boxes anytime during this presentation. And um, then I'm pleased to introduce today's um, presentation. So today's Grand Rounds is really um, reflecting a close partnership between University of Colorado, Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, and a representative from our long-term care residential communities. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Hilary Lum, who's gonna introduce the different presenters today and also serve as the moderator for today's presentation. So thank you, Hilary. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity for our team and collaboration to share. I will share my screen to get us started and also do introductions at that time. It's of course this, um, this, this awkwardness of share the screen, but then it's not the correct screen. So then stop share, share the correct screen. Um, I don't know why it's always like that, but in any case, um, we are really excited to share this clinical update on monoclonal antibody therapy for COVID-19 in Colorado. Dr. Agit Gindi, as I look at our overview, will uh, kick us off. He is a professor of emergency medicine and um, directs many different programs within the CCTSI and specifically this large grant related to monoclonal antibody uh, effectiveness in the real world here at Colorado. He'll tell us more about that. Then we'll transition to hearing from Dr. Diana Tepe. She did her uh, pediatrics residency here at university, sorry, medical school here at University of Colorado and then residency in Texas and now works uh, at CDPHE and she's joined by Shannon O'Brien. Um, together they will present an update that was just released this week, which we're very interested in hearing about and we'll have a chance to ask questions to understand the process better. I'll then present a bit about integration of monoclonal antibodies into clinical care, and we'll leave a lot of time, more than 15 minutes, for question and answers. And I've invited our uh, local pharmacist from Fitzsimmons Community Living Center with the Colorado Department of Human Services, Dr. General Jennifer Connolly, who's been a leader in uh, really moving forward the opportunity for monoclonal antibody treatment in long-term care settings. So we're excited for this um, dynamic presentation. I'm now gonna stop, stop share because Dr. Gindy will share his slides. Hello, good morning, everyone. It's really good to be with you. Hillary, uh, thumbs up, can you see my screen? Okay. Um, so uh, like Hillary said, uh, we'll be spending about 20 minutes giving a, a update on the clinical data um, on monoclonal antibodies. Um, appreciate being with this group as a former uh, Beeson scholar, spent a lot of time uh, in this forum and with this group, uh, so happy to return to, to talk about this topic. Uh, quickly, some uh, disclosures of current funding. To the left are the ones that are relevant to today's presentation on monoclonal antibodies. As Hillary said, our uh, NCATS grant, grant that includes a number of uh, call and people in the CCTSI on implementation and real world effectiveness of monoclonal antibodies. Um, and then I'm part of the leadership of ACTIVE3, which is an inpatient platform to study uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, in that population. You know, uh, conflicts of interest to declare. Um, to get us oriented to where we are in the current uh, Delta surge, these are data um, from yesterday from the CDC, um, starting in the US uh, um, to see cases and hospitalizations going down, uh, cases in the red, hospitalizations in orange. Um, 
starting to see cases coming down in Colorado. Hospitalizations haven't quite, certainly starting to plateau. Uh, we've seen at UC Health at least uh, uh, cases start, or hospitalizations starting to come down. Um, I think we're all gearing up for future waves. Um, each of these plateaus uh, led to maybe some um, hope that we were done and uh, then the new wave occurred. Um, and I think with this winter coming up, I think preparing for these surges in cases and hospitalizations are really important. And part of this is uh, here's US vaccinations, here's Colorado vaccinations, certainly seeing a plateau and decline in the number of vaccinations um, administered. Um, and so we still have an unfortunately high, although doing better in Colorado than uh, the rest of the country, um, uh, unvaccinated population. Um, here's our spectrum of illness uh, for COVID. Um, and our focus today primarily in the clinical data will be on mild symptomatic illness in the outpatient setting to really prevent progression to hospitalization, severe disease, death, um, and enhance recovery. Um, but we'll also spend a little time out here in the exposed patients um, for prophylaxis because there's emerging data for monoclonals in that population as well. Um, and we'll also touch on uh, monoclonal use in hospitalized patients. So for orientation, we're talking about neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. So these are directed at the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, it's been a focus of uh, federal efforts from back in the Operation Warp Speed days and continuing through the new administration, an intense public-private partnership, um, and uh, really, you know, leading candidate within the therapeutic platform for the federal government. It's been really fascinating uh, to be involved in, in the effort. Uh, these are uh, laboratory-made synthetic uh, human neutralizing IgGs. Um, that are directed at the virus. They originate from B cells of recovered patients. Um, all but one were SARS-CoV-2 recovered patients. And actually the sotrovimab, the GSK was from a SARS-1 patient. Um, so it's an interesting molecule in that way. Binds to various aspects of the spike protein of the virus that essentially uh, uh, interferes with interaction with the ACE2 receptor on host cells. So prevents viral replication. These can be given alone or in combination as uh, uh, colloquially referred to as cocktails. Um, and those uh, combination agents may uh, reduce prevent, uh, potential for escape mutations and also uh, can complement each other um, in terms of um, effectiveness at uh, viral recovery. So I'm going to run through some data. And, you know, that's been a little bit of a, um, of a saga over the last year. Um, so just touch on you may see bits and pieces of these data that, as they came out. Um, so here was sort of the first uh, paper that came out in New England Journal um, last October, so nearly a year ago. This was a phase two uh, trial from the uh, uh, Lilly monoclonal bamlanivimab. And uh, this was only um, about 500 or 450 patients. Their primary outcome was change in viral load, which at 11 days, everyone cleared the virus. Uh, reasonably well. There was a little bit of a change at three days. Then the focus became on ho prevention of hospitalization. So there was a signal here for 6% hospitalization rate in the placebo group, 1.6% in the uh, intervention group. But dealing with really low numbers still, nine hospitalizations versus five hospitalizations. So really promising signal, um, a lot of interest. Um, and we had nothing um, in the outpatient setting and actually don't have anything else besides this. So it was very unsatisfying to tell, especially high-risk patients, yeah, good luck with that COVID. Um, we'll see you if you need to be hospitalized um, and stay away from other people. So it offered some hope, led to an emergency use authorization from the FDA, in particular high-risk patients. Uh, this is now expanded, so I won't go into details here. Um, starting in early November uh, for the Lilly uh, monoclonal, Couple weeks later, uh, Regeneron issued a press release followed by a New England Journal publication for their interim uh, results. Um, this was at that time, 800 patients uh, randomized one to one to one to high or low dose monoclonals versus placebo. And they reported at that time a 57% reduction of healthcare, uh, COVID related healthcare visits amongst those receiving the intervention and uh, potentially enhanced signal in those with one or more risk factors for severe disease, which is sort of where 
those criteria originally came from for uh, administering it only to high-risk patients. And a couple of weeks later, they received uh, their emergency use authorization. And uh, we'll hear a little bit more about the timeline of the uh, implementation, but essentially uh, drug was available for Lilly at the end of November in Colorado and uh, about a month later for Regeneron for administering to patients. There were some challenges early on, and I say early, but these are still, uh, most of these still ongoing challenges limited drug availability. This was a big concern at the beginning. If every eligible patient received monoclonals at that time in uh, late November, early December, we would have run out of drug in two and a half days um, in Colorado. And so there was uh, CDPHE in collaboration with um, University of Colorado and others um, implemented a random allocation system, but the demand just was not there. And there's a number of reasons for that. So less than 5% of eligible patients were accessing treatment. The random allocation never actually really meaningfully turned on. Um, and, uh, and you know we still are struggling with sort of the outreach, although uh, definitely improving the, uh, the ability to, uh, the knowledge about treatment and the processes. Still ongoing struggles from the very beginning with equity issues where mostly non-Hispanic white patients are receiving this treatment and primarily those with robust access to care or some sort of connections to the system um, to be able to navigate, very challenging. Um, there's been shifting guidance um, in, uh, in the distribution processes, and this is not uh, at all a criticism of our colleagues at CDPHU who've worked tirelessly to help with this, but you know, originally it was a state-run system, then it got uh, became a federal-run system, you could direct order, and recently uh, was a state-run system again. So just a lot of change. Um, the one thing I think we've addressed, which we'll see is at that time, there was still lingering uncertainty about benefit and risk. We we're dealing with early phase two data, um, sometimes just by press release. And so, um, you know, I think we've been able to fill that gap at least and they're a different place today. So then Mark, uh, kind of moving forward in March, uh, we were starting to see press releases from the phase three data. So this is the uh, Lilly combination agent now, BAM and Eddy, um, showing an 80%, 87% reduction in hospitalization and, and death. Um, Regeneron then put out a press release a couple of weeks later, showing a 70% reduction in hospitalization and death um, amongst higher risk patients. And importantly, um, Regeneron collected data on symptoms. So recognizing that the vast majority of patients do not get hospitalized or die, uh, quality of life and symptom reduction, really important. And they reported a four-day median reduction in symptoms, which is quite uh, clinically meaningful. And around that same time, uh, the uh, VIR uh, 7831 molecule, which is citrovimab, uh, now marketed by GlaxoSmithKline, uh, published their common ICE results with an 85% reduction in hospitalization or death. So pretty consistent signals here in the phase three data. Um, we'll look at data from Lilly and Regeneron. Uh, the uh, GSK uh, Citrovimab is still in press release form and we haven't seen full data publicly. Um, but this then in early April led to what I think was a paradigm shift in our knowledge um, of the treatment, which uh, was the NIH guidelines now recommended this treatment as a class A, the highest level of evidence for treatment of high-risk outpatients. Um, and, uh, there was, there was and is only one other treatment that falls into this category in the guidelines, which is corticosteroids or dexamethasone for critical COVID. Um, so this is from then and the data continue to strengthen a highly recommended treatment. So uh, here are the uh, currently available uh, results from uh, the Regeneron outpatient trial, um, still in preprint, uh, peer review publication should be forthcoming in the next month about 4,000 outpatients with at least one risk factor for severe disease, high and low dose for, or high or low dose for placebo, followed for 28 days. Um, cohort was young-ish, um, 50 years old is median age, 14% were greater than 65 years old, uh, but kind of confirmed about the press release results, 71% uh, reduction in hospitalization and death, four day reduction in median symptom duration, Importantly, adverse events or infusion-related events, very low, less than 0.3%, um, and that's continued in the uh, sort of post-implementation experience as well. 
Um, and this trial stopped early for efficacy. Um, here are the time to event uh, curves um, with proportion of patients with hospitalization or death um, and a nice separation between curves on the top. The lower is the reduction in symptom duration. So not only is there separation here between both dose groups and the placebo, but actually persists out to one month. So there's a difference in the proportion of patients that are still having ongoing symptoms at one month. So this is starting to get into the longer COVID space. And so certainly a important patient-centered uh, outcome. Um, around that time, uh, the FDA lowered uh, the dose authorization um, for uh, the Regeneron uh, monoclonal to 1200 milligrams, and importantly, then authorized subcutaneous dosing. Um, there's not data on subcutaneous dosing uh, for treatment efficacy. There are unpublished data on reduction in viral load and pharmacokinetics. And then we'll look at some data in prophylaxis. Uh, but this is important. There's still a preference for IV dosing, but sometimes IV treatment is just not possible. And so this now, starting from June, authorized subcutaneous dosing as an alternative when IV treatment is not available, immediately available, because um, time is important. In July, we saw the phase three trial results in the New England Journal from the Lilly combination agent. This is 1,000 outpatients with the one or more risk factors for severe disease. A um, little bit of an older cohort, median age uh, 54, 31% were um, over age 65, uh, reported a 70% reduction in hospitalization or death. Um, with a uh, recurring theme of what these uh, uh, Kaplan-Meier curves look like um, with nice separation uh, between the groups starting in the first week. So those are the data, which um, I would say are fairly strong, um, phase three data for uh, outpatient treatment. What about prophylaxis? Um, so this is important, uh, particularly for this group. Uh, this is a JAMA publication from early June looking at uh, the Lilly single agent, bamlanivimab versus placebo um, in skilled nursing and assisted living facilities. So there was 966 either residents or staff of the facilities that had at least one positive case. About one third were residents, two thirds were staff. Uh, randomized to uh, BAM intravenously or placebo, followed for a couple months. Residents, as you would expect, uh, median age 75, the staff were a median age of 43. And overall, there was a reduction in symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection by 57%, with perhaps a signal for uh, increased efficacy amongst the residents uh, compared to the staff. Uh, I think that's more visually apparent in the Kaplan-Meier curves. Here are the residents with really nice separation and uh, prevention of symptomatic infection whereas a little less clear in the staff, although uh, you start to see when you get further out, um, some separation between the groups there. Regeneron um, also has had a, a prophylactic study. This was not in uh, long-term care facilities, but were focused on uh, symptom or on household contacts of symptomatic uh, infected patients. This was published in the New England Journal in August. Um, so the important thing here is this is now subcutaneous dosing. So the Lilly prophylaxis trial still required IV dosing, but here now testing subcutaneous dosing, um, which has some logistical challenges too in that it requires four injections, but does not require an IV. So different levels of providers can administer this. Their cohort was fairly young of these household contacts, median age of 43, um, uh, but they reported an 81% reduction um, in the incidence of symptomatic infection with the familiar looking Kaplan-Meier curve here as well. Uh, one thing that they did was also amongst those that developed symptomatic infection, looked at symptom duration. Now there was only 11 patients in the intervention group, 59 in the placebo group, but actually only one week duration of symptoms uh, on average in the intervention group and three weeks in the placebo group. So, uh, much lower incidence of infection. And if you do get infected, the cases uh, seem to be milder from a symptom standpoint. And then the FDA authorized both of these agents for post-exposure prophylaxis um, in COVID-19. One other category of prophylaxis, which is really uh, just recently emerging, this comes from the uh, PROVENT-3 trial, which is looking at this AstraZeneca molecule, AZD7442. Hopefully they will 
name their map with something that we can actually pronounce easily. Um, but they uh, looked at not uh, necessarily exposed patients, just negative community dwelling patients um, and reported top line results in a press release with a 77% reduction of symptomatic um, uh, COVID infection. It's a couple of unique features here. One, there's 5,000 patients. Um, uh, nearly half were over age 65, most with comorbidities. Um, the important thing here are twofold. One, this was an intramuscular dosing. Um, so easy to administer and you could imagine in the future actually could even be amenable to auto injection like we do for EpiPens, for example, uh, versus placebo. Um, primary prevention, so this is different. This is not an uh, exposure paradigm. This is a uh, just people out in the community that might get exposed. And there's a, a, a mutation here on the AstraZeneca that um, extends the half-life, a YTE mutant. The half-life is actually uh, up to about three months. So this can last in the system for you know, close to a year, but provide good protection for six to nine months. Um, they followed patients for six months for the primary endpoint. And again, 77% reduction in symptomatic infection. Um, low numbers of severe disease, but zero cases in the intervention group, three cases among which two died in the placebo group. Um, and again, this half-life extension puts it on the table that this might be a viable strategy in particular to augment vaccination for those that don't respond well to vaccination. So this could be immunocompromised patients. This could even be immunosenescent older patients. Um, that may not just be responding well to the vaccine. This offers um, another potential solution. Um, I'll call out uh, Myra Levin, who many of you know was uh, one of the lead investigators um, on this trial. And the publication is forthcoming, and presumably an emergency authorization will be forthcoming in the next couple of months. Quickly, we're uh, getting close to time. Hospitalized patients. So uh, these were original results. So this is the uh, platform I'm involved in, Active 3. Uh, we published results um, starting in uh, uh, December on our uh, phase two component of our 2-3 trial, got stopped early for futility um, at only 314 patients, median age of 61. These are all hospitalized patients. We looked at time to sustain recovery, which meant being discharged from the hospital to the prior uh, level of care uh, pre-hospitalization and staying there for at least two weeks no separation between the groups here. So it was thought, you know, maybe this is just too late to give to hospitalized patients. The story is kind of emerging that actually baseline zero status, um, so the antibody status um, at hospitalization or at trial entry is really important. So here's zero negative patients, antibody negative patients, um, that shows a potential signal for a speedier uh, and sustained recovery in the treatment group. And actually the opposite effect, an antibody positive patients, there may actually be a harm signal here with the P of 0.02 for interaction. This is not in the New England Journal publication, is in preprint, but will be coming out in peer review pretty soon. Um, similarly, we looked at uh, a composite as a secondary endpoint of death, uh, serious adverse events or an organ failure. Um, not much going on here in the aggregate group, but in the antibody negative patients, actually prevention of these um, uh, outcomes or signal for it, the antibody positive group, the opposite, where there might be a harm signal um, with, uh, again, a statistically significant interaction term. This really got driven home by the recovery platform from the UK, pragmatic trial, open label, but large numbers, almost 10,000 patients. Um, looking at the Regeneron agent versus usual care. And again, all participants, their primary endpoint was in hospital mortality. Not much going on here. And you might say, well, yeah, this doesn't really work. Uh, but then when you stratify by zero status, and their primary analysis uh, plan was in the zero negative patients, you look at the zero negative patients, there's actually a remarkable reduction in mortality, 20% reduction in mortality in that group. Whereas again, for the seropositive patients, um, very unlikely to be benefit and maybe even a harm signal there as well. Uh, we'll say that seronegative patients as an overall group uh, seem to be much sicker um, in the hospital than the seropositive patients. So these are patients not really mounting a good immune response. And these tend to be 
older patients or older sicker and immunocompromised patients. Um, so uh, uh, why might this be happening, especially a harm signal? There's something called antibody dependent enhancement. Um, this is just a conceptual model of the two ways you can get sort of worsening of disease paradoxically because of antibodies. One could be because the antibody is non-neutralizing and actually because of FC effector function can actually facilitate um, cell entry and enhance viral replication. The second is the ability for these uh, antibodies to form immune complexes and cause downstream uh, inflammation, especially in the airway. So current state before we hand it over. So we have uh, the NIH treatment guidelines last updated um, uh, less than a week ago. That's still strongly recommending for non-hospitalized patients uh, to, uh, that are not on new supplemental oxygen to receive one of the three authorized uh, monoclonals for treatment of outpatients to pro prevent progression to severe disease. There's a caveat here that there's some limitations on uh, drug supply, but especially limitations on access to treatment, given that it's intravenous in many places. So there was this update earlier this month um, that uh, when there's logistical constraints on administration of the agents, prioritizing treatment over post-exposure prophylaxis. So that's number one, uh, just in terms of doing the most potential for good. And then prioritizing unvaccinated or completely vaccinated individuals um, or uh, um, vaccinated individuals who are immunocompromised. Um, there is like this not expected to amount in, in an adequate immune response. So I think that can be interpreted as maybe some older immunosenescent patients that are not mounting good immune responses. There's a little bit of vagueness in the language, um, but that is uh, to try and do the most good uh, given that these people are the most likely to be hospitalized. So the bottom line is uh, this should be really a standard care treatment for uh, confirmed positive SARS-CoV-2 infected patients who are not hospitalized, not requiring new oxygen therapy or increase in baseline oxygen ideally administered within the first seven days of symptom onset, although authorized for up to 10 days, and at risk for progression to severe disease. Um, the EUA criteria um, allow for a pretty broad range where about 80% of positives will meet the criteria, um, although the focus on the highest risk is including older adults really important. Prophylaxis, especially post-exposure, um, is authorized. Um, so individual household contacts or facility exposures uh, could be important uh, part of our arsenal. Um, and then the potential for vaccine augmentation with the AstraZeneca molecule in the future. And then um, I suspect that very soon we'll be treating hospitalized seronegative patients um, under an EUA. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Gimby. And I will pass it to Dr. Tepe. All right, thank you. So now that we've had that excellent summary of the science and the evidence, I'm just gonna go over a little more of the logistics of how to get all these things. Um, so first of all, the available monoclonal antibodies for outpatient therapy, um, the bamlanivimab etisevimab is available now for treatment and post-exposure prophylaxis, and it's in an IV formulation. The casarivimab and devimab, which is the Regencove one, is available for treatment and post-exposure prophylaxis, and it's available in both IV and sub-Q forms. And then sotrovimab is available for treatment in an IV form. So a few little notes there at the bottom, the distribution and use of bamlanivimab and etisevimab was recently restarted. And I'm gonna go over the roller coaster timeline of what that monoclonal antibody has been through for its authorization on the next slide. Um, for Regencove, um, please remember that the IV is formulation is preferred for treatment, um, but you can use sub-Q if delaying, um, if doing it by IV would delay treatment at all. Um, for the post-exposure prophylaxis, you can use either one. And then sotrovimab right this minute is not distributed by HHS and the federal government, but that is likely going to change in the next few weeks. Um, so for that bamlanivimab etisevimab timeline, so like Dr. Gindi went over, bamlanivimab was initially authorized last November of 2020. And then in February, they authorized the combination of bamlanivimab etisevimab. Um, please note that etisevimab has never been authorized as a monotherapy. 
In April, the authorization for bamlanivimab alone was revoked due to the increase in circulating resistant variants. And then in June, they decided to pause distribution of the combination bamlanivimab edisevimab, and that was because of circulation of resistant variants, specifically beta and gamma. In August, they then resumed um, distribution of it um, for any area of the country where the resistant variants are make up less than 5% of the circulating variants. Um, as Delta has Delta variant has taken over, right now the entire country qualifies to use bam -Eddy. Um, And then just earlier this month in September, they actually expanded the EUA to authorize it for post-exposure prophylaxis as well. Um, so this new ordering and distribution process, um, initially when monoclonal antibodies were first um, authorized starting last fall, they were at a um, state distribution process where they were allocated to the states and the states then allocated them within the state. Um, due to um, not a lot of demand, it seemed like that was um, putting a middleman in where one wasn't needed. So they went to the direct ordering process in February of this year. Um, with the increase in cases and Delta variant taking over this summer, through July and August, they were seeing a 20% increase in orders, and they reached the point where the federal office just couldn't handle being the one place that all the orders for the whole country went. So they went back to a state process. So what happens is each week on Monday, HHS publishes allocation numbers for all the states and territories and says, this is how many doses you're gonna get of each monoclonal antibody for this week, figure out where you want to put them. How we have set this up for Colorado at CDPHE is we have a red cap form where the link is at the bottom of this a slide called a status of supply form. And sites that wish to order monoclonal antibodies can just get on there and it just asks how many doses you currently have on hand, how many doses you're requesting, um, and a few other questions on there. That is due by midnight on Wednesday night each week. And then on Thursday and Friday, our team at CDPHE determines what, how we're gonna use our state's allocation and places all the orders with HHS. Um, the monoclonal antibodies then get delivered the following week. Once everything shakes out, um, the delivery day each week should be the same each site, um, but it may not be the same for every single site. So each site can depend on getting their monoclonal antibodies the same day of the week. Um, part of the allocation process is making sure that the monoclonal antibodies are being used and not just sitting on a shelf. So any site that is ordering monoclonal antibodies is required to report utilization data. There are three different reporting systems based on the site type. And I'm not gonna go into the nitty gritty of each one, um, but I do have the link on the slide there for when this goes out that has more information on how to get signed up with the proper um, proper reporting system. And then through this whole thing, it is only the ordering and distribution process that has changed. How you prescribe this and refer a patient for monoclonal antibodies has not changed. Um, so basically you just need to determine if your patient meets the eligibility criteria for either treatment or post-exposure prophylaxis. And then there are two ways to get them hooked up with their treatment. You can either use the monoclonal antibody connector tool, which is available on the CDPHE website, or you can simply provide them with a written prescription or an electronic prescription and contact information for an administration site. And with that, I will hand it back over to Dr. Lum. Thank you so much. This is uh, exciting to hear of the new process. Um, and I really appreciate um, these presentations. And I know that our audience today is quite diverse, um, representing individuals um, across multiple different care settings, including the VA. And so we're trying to share some up-to-date data, some uh, information on how healthcare facilities can obtain a supply of the medication. And now I'm going to transition into how might we integrate into clinical practice. Um, you'll hear some repetition, and we think that that's important so that we can emphasize the key points um, and helps us with our uh, clinical integration. So um, this does summarize what you've heard already in terms of the efficacy of the cocktails, uh, reducing risk of hospitalization and death. Importantly, at the patient level, decreasing symptoms by four days, 
Uh, I'd be interested in knowing if we have any data about impact on uh, longer term outcomes like long COVID symptoms. So maybe Dr. Gindi can share with us about that. Um, the cocktails are effective against Delta variant. Adverse events are rare and often occurring within 30 minutes. So even the required one hour monitoring time um, may be more than sufficient and we may see changes in that required amount of time. We've talked about uh, subcutaneous being available if IV is not feasible. Importantly, monoclonal antibody therapy can be given regardless of vaccination status. Then vaccination can occur 90 days after monoclonal antibody treatment. And we've discussed how it can be given as post-exposure prophylaxis. And again, I welcome any Q&A uh, discussing some of these nuances, especially for older adults. So I just wanna give you an overview of some of the basics um, of administrating, uh, administering MAB, whether you're counseling patients or you're a clinic or long-term care facility, considering how you would um, set this up. As part of our monoclonal uh, antibody Colorado project, we've created a number of handouts that are available on our website. We're happy to share with any um, provider or clinic that would be interested in using these in your process to educate patients. So, you know, from the very basics as a clinician, we would encourage you to read the EUA. Um, that is something that you need to then give to patients uh, at the time of counseling if they agree to uh, this treatment. And there are some details here um, just to sort of emphasize the point that the monoclonal antibody can be stored in the refrigerator can be out for 20 minutes prior to administration, must be used within four hours. We have a pharmacist here who can answer more questions specifically about this, if there are questions from the audience. And then we have some details about how sub-Q is given as four separate injections or how IV can be infused. So thinking about this in terms of a clinician checklist, uh, we've alluded to this, but we hope that it's about determining eligibility, discussing treatment with shared decision-making, then identifying a treatment location, referring and ordering. And we are very aware that there are cost access or transportation concerns that may be relevant to your patient or their close family members. Um, so we'll walk through each of these steps with some of the tips we're hearing from providers in the community who have navigated this system. It does, take a little bit of time and process the first time you do it. And so we really encourage providers to be prepared um, before you find that someone might be eligible. In terms of determining eligibility, we've talked about this already so far. Um, we have the, on CDPHE's website, as well as our website, we have a handout with a bit of a flow diagram. Bottom line, especially for our older adults. Um, they are all older than age 65 and um, likely at uh, increased risk of severe COVID. So from my perspective, uh, it would be who isn't eligible rather than who is eligible. High risk criteria specifically from the EUA are listed here. Of note, the EUA also says that healthcare providers should consider the benefit risk for the individual patient and that we don't need to specifically mention one of the listed health conditions as the reason that someone is high risk. Also, the EUA calls out that other medical conditions or factors, example being uh, race or ethnicity, may also place individuals at high risk for severe COVID. So then moving to uh, treatment discussions, we recently created a handout that hopefully supports physician and provider um, counseling. This is an example script that you could consider of how to introduce the antibody treatment, how to describe either IV or sub-Q, and then some language about the side effects. And that all together, this takes 1.5 to two hours. A little bit of information again about how to find an infusion site. This is that same um, CDPHE website where there is a list. Uh, that website is my first recommendation for anyone interested in finding out what is the current state of how I can find my patient uh, treatment uh, in the community and what are the nuances of current guidance. There are, are maps of where 
uh, infusion sites are um, located around Colorado. Um, of note, this doesn't necessarily include everyone who has received a supply through the CDPHE site, or at least prior to um, our most recent change. Um, so you can certainly always reach out to CDPHE with that email that Dr. Tepe shared um, if you're having trouble locating an infusion site. Referral and order treatment is the next step. Here are some screenshots and again, that monoclonal antibody connector tool. Um, I think because some of us used this back in November when it was still random allocation, um, hopefully one takeaway is that you know that this is how you use this process. It's not random, it's not experimental, um, and it is available, uh, though there is certainly an importance of us knowing where it's available so that we can facilitate that for our patients. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on cost and access issues. As a project team with our patient and family and community member stakeholders, we're really trying to understand um, the barriers that individuals face. While we know that the federal government has purchased doses, there still can be a fair amount of uncertainty of what the actual cost to people is. Um, certainly deductibles apply. So if you have a high deductible plan and you've not met it, that you can likely anticipate a facility related fee uh, from the infusion center. Um, we also are looking into, you know, what are the costs to individuals who may be uninsured or have different insurances. Um, we know that there's variability across infusion sites of if they identify that a person doesn't have insurance, whether then they still subsequently bill for the facility fees. Um, some are waiving them. Certainly patients may face transportation issues. So some clinics have then um, noted that if they do testing on site in clinic, they might then be able to also offer subcutaneous treatment in clinic. Um, Southern Ute Medical Center in Cortez, Colorado uh, has been able to successfully do this and we developed this um, graphic showing their process from rapid testing, waiting for the results um, in the moment, then uh, treatment eligibility assessment by the medical assistant, handoff to the provider and pharmacist for counseling and ordering, then four small injections under the skin and monitoring for one hour. Their clinic has been set up with um, uh, the negative pressure rooms and so they're able to do this with PPE um, sort of day of. <clears throat> we also know that home health administration um, is being done by Berkeley Home Health and maybe a model adopted by additional home health agencies. So take home points as emphasized by our other providers, uh, presenters as well, are that the monoclonal antibody treatments are available through the EUA. None are fully FDA approved yet. Early treatment is likely better. Um, if there's a need to proactively identify your local treatment options. And I'm uh, very interested in, in our discussion related to the nuances for bringing this into practice for our older adults. So with that, I'll stop share. Um, and I wanted to um, also just give us a chance to hear briefly from Dr. Connolly. I didn't ask you to uh, pre uh, prepare slides, but I'd love to hear um, your perspective of how treating individuals in the long-term care setting has, has gone, if you can give us a snapshot um, description of that. Let me try again. <laughs> sure. So very early on when um, it was identified that this was gonna be very efficacious and useful for our, our patient population, we moved to mobilize them. With um, BAM, LAM, Eddie. Um, to start, and the biggest challenge we faced with that was delivery time, when the clock said go, because a lot of our facilities are in rural areas, and we don't have a delivery service. We usually we use FedEx or UPS to make those deliveries, so that would uh, not be feasible if we were trying to deliver these monoclonal antibodies to those facilities. So we had a pharmacist, and she stepped up, and she said, I will drive them. Um, we need to have a plan in place. We will reconstitute the IV bag at the pharmacy and I will set out on the road in a refrigerated um, cooler box and we will keep it on ice until we get to the facility. I will stay there. We will watch the administration. We will help monitoring. 
We will be on site if needed to um, provide any kind of supportive care as far as any allergic reactions or anaphylaxis. And we will have the e-kit ready. And, and so we really said, all right, let's go, let's do this. Um, the whole ball game changed when Regencove came out and said uh, prophylaxis and when it was sub-Q injection. Cause then I was like, okay, now I have a whole new strategy in mind. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mobilize and put 10 doses at each facility right away so that we can use it sub-Q. Um, I found a couple barriers with the IV and the barriers included establishing the IV line, something that maybe not everybody realizes, but a lot of our patients when they come and they are on IV therapy, maybe that gets started at a hospital. And then we follow up and we continue that IV, but our nurses aren't always um, up on their skills as far as starting those IVs. So that, that puts into a complication as far as establishing those lines. And, um, and then the patients were dehydrated. The, the three patients that we treated with IV monoclonal antibodies, they were too dehydrated for the nurses to establish that line. Um, so one ended up going out to the hospital, one ended up not receiving therapy, and one eventually they did start the line, but um, not with comfort. I mean, he was poked a couple different times before that line was started. So when the subcutaneous came out, that, that was a game changer for us. And, um, and then especially with prophylaxis in those rural areas. So we have one facility who had a whole unit, um, over two dozen patients who were identified and evaluated to see if they met criteria. And we ended up treating 19 of that two dozen patients um, over there. And they all did well, very well. And the other issue with the IV was the nursing time because they have to sit through the infusion plus they have to sit through the monitoring were four subcutaneous injections given right away that really shortened the whole duration of their monitoring by an hour. And when a facility is short on staff to begin with, that was key in the nurses, you know, to be able to, to provide that monitoring time. Thank you, that's a, a very helpful review of what your experience has been like and how you've needed to be nimble as this has been really an evolving um, situation of, of what's available and then how we facilitate it and um, appreciate that someone went the distance literally driving the medication. Um, so a question came in uh, from Dr. Pallet. How do infusion centers, and I would also say long-term care facilities, any healthcare entity, know how many doses to request ahead of time with the new state ordering system? And I'll uh, pass that to uh, Dr. Tibet, to pay or to um, Shannon. Um, so it the ordering system is a weekly system. So we get an allocation every week. So I would recommend that you order or request really about how many doses you expect to use in the following week. Um, and if you add a few doses to that, that's okay. We'll do our best to balance everything. If you end up with a few extra doses, our goal is not that you will run out. We're not gonna come take them away. <laughs> um, we'll just make whatever adjustments we need to make the following week. But yeah, you'll have the chance to request again the following week. So I would request about how many you think you'll use in a week. Well, <clears throat> we wait for other questions. To be Can I actually ask a follow-up question to Dr. Tepe, which is sometimes there are outbreaks in a facility, for example, and with the new ordering system, waiting a week to meet that uh, demand for prophylaxis in the facility may not be optimal. Um, how would you suggest that, uh, in particular, long-term care facilities um, handle that? Let us know at CDPHE and we will do everything we can to help redistribute the supply within the state. If there are doses not already being used somewhere else, we will try to help get them moved. Um, and we are also working on, it's not completely up and running yet, but we're working on having a response system within CDPHE exactly for that type of purpose. And so that we will also have a supply that we can use for um, urgent situations like that. 
Um, maybe this can be to Dr. Connolly. A question came in. When subcutaneous administration is used, are the injections given all at once or are they spaced somehow? Um, and maybe you can also say location. Yeah, so they are given all at once, but in different location spots. Um, and that's just, it could be two in the upper arm, um, two in the abdomen, you could do the upper thigh. They really suggest that you avoid the waistline and, and you know, avoid the navel area, but they're all given at the same time. Very simple since it's just like an insulin injection, comfortable patients don't have much complaints. Um, there was some injection site reactions noted in studies, but we did not see any in our patients. Um, there was no itching, no redness, no complaints. I might add a, a comment, a question that comes up not infrequently is, can't we just concentrate this a little bit more and reduce the number of injections uh, from the volume standpoint? We've asked this question several different ways of uh, Regeneron uh, <laughs> leadership and scientists, and it's actually not a manufacturing and logistical issue. It's an FDA issue because then it's a change in formulation and then would require uh, repeat of testing and authorization. So there's no plans to change that four injection strategy in the near future. Uh, but it's great to hear sort of on the ground uh, uh, feedback that it's not, does not seem to be a barrier. I'm sure there would be a preference for one injection, but that it's still feasible to administer the four injections. Yeah, and um, to add on to it, surprisingly enough, there is a huge stigma among the patients that, you know, I had to call out the POAs and the family members to get you know, authors, their authorization to, to give this to their loved ones. And there's a huge stigma around the IV formulation. When they heard it was available as sub Q, they were more likely to say yes to, to for us to provide this to their loved ones. Um, I don't know, maybe it's the IV makes it sound like it's more serious than just saying an injection. So there was a lot less stigma around just doing the subcutaneous injections. Yeah, I think that um, issue of wording and perception is uh, very interesting and also something that our project team has been working on. Uh, I'm going to introduce Bethany Kwan. Uh, she is our lead for our dissemination and implementation efforts within this project. And there's a question here. Why do you think anti-vaxxers in Texas and Florida and I would say Missouri, including um, family members um, are having objections to the vaccine, but we're readily accepting of the antibody. Um, so Bethany has done a lot of um, leadership of work that we've done with stakeholder engagement, and I'm going to ask her to give an opinion. Uh, so that's an excellent question. We don't know answers of that for sure. I can speculate a little bit. Um, there is maybe some concerns that the vaccine has been politicized. Um, there's potentially some concern that it doesn't feel real, uh, that there's been distrust of, of COVID even being a real thing until you're actually sick. Um, there's all, also um, potentially, so there's been concerns about how the, the mechanism of action of the vaccine, the concerns about the mRNA and, and thinking that, that um, mRNA means that it's somehow modifying your DNA. And so you know, providing this infusion of antibodies maybe feels a little bit less like it's um, affecting your DNA in some way. Again, this is all speculation. These are just the sorts of things that um, we, we've heard in the literature and a lot in the media and on social media in particular. So great question. Um, it's something that we hope to explore throughout our project. If I can add uh, one more thing, um, which is, you know, it's challenging um, from a messaging standpoint because there is a temptation to um, want to use this uh, highly effective treatment as a vaccine replacement um, on an individual basis, or in some cases, sort of on a state basis. Um, and that we're trying to sort of change that narrative to moving prevention as far upstream as possible. Um, vaccination first, second and third strategy for prevention. And if you do get sick, and you know, ideally, 
uh, more of the population would be vaccinated. Um, so there could be breakthrough infections for a number of reasons, including um, impaired immune response to the vaccine or you know, the hopefully smaller and smaller numbers of unvaccinated patients, there is a treatment available, but not that this is an alternative to vaccination. Even with the AstraZeneca monoclonal that we presented the data on long um, acting prophylaxis, the plan is as an augmentation to vaccination, not as a replacement to vaccination. Absolutely. And that was one of the talking points when I was getting our POAs and family members to agree to the authorization to use the monoclonal antibodies is that really the passive and the active immunity and how they work together. But um, very important to note that the, the monoclonal antibodies that provide that passive immunity, it's only good for four weeks. So you really need that vaccination for the, the longevity and, and that active immunity. Thanks for these comments. Um, from the Q&A, uh, Bennett Parnes asks, if an older adult tests positive with very minor symptoms, should this be offered? Uh, what if the patient is improving by the time the COVID test comes back, still offer it? Um, Adit, what would be your approach to this? So I think it is impossible to project the trajectory of illness. We know that the median time to hospitalization is in the seven to eight day range and often people start with minor symptoms. We also know that this treatment is most effective when given as early as possible. So I would judge it based on the risk of the patient. Um, and if you feel like your patient is at risk for future uh, progression to severe disease, don't wait until there is signs of impending severe disease uh, because you know, while it's still, if they don't require new supplemental oxygen or not yet hospitalized, there's still the opportunity to give treatment kind of missed out on an opportunity to try to um, prevent that progression. We don't have complete data um, on uh, progression to long-term symptoms. Uh, and we, are, we in our MAP Colorado project, are hoping we're following patients out to three months for symptom recovery. Uh, so hoping to add to that uh, literature. Um, but we do know that even there's a reduction in um, active symptoms at one month from the Regeneron data. Um, and so from a patient-centered standpoint, and certainly from a uh, prevention or progression to severe disease, early symptomatic illness, earlier the better, is uh, the recommended approach. And thanks for that. I agree. Um, I also appreciate the comment that Steve shared. Um, if you are giving one of the monoclonal antibodies sub-Q, um, having the supplies, including, you know, the 18-gauge needle to draw it up and then um, being able to administer. So I wanted to open it up and really thank our pharmacists, um, our representatives from CDPHE, Dr. Gindi, um, any closing comments that you'd like to leave um, for this presentation? I think there's one more question, I'm trying to pull it up uh, before we oh, close. Yes, absolutely. Uh, what do the costs of these treatments look like um, in, in terms of overall? Yeah, so per dose, um, so one thing is that uh, fortunately the federal government has made a, a large investment in these treatments and actually re-upped uh, buying 1.4 million doses of Regeneron and likely uh, Citrovimab, the GSK agent as well. If you buy it uh, separately, so right now if you're getting Citrovimab, you have to buy it outside the federal purchase at $2,000 a dose. Um, and so it's fairly expensive. Vaccines clearly are less uh, expensive. Um, the administration cost, or the reimbursement for uh, uh, administration for Medicare is in the $400 range for facility um, injection or infusion and $750 for home. Um, so that doesn't reflect actual costs. It depends on many factors, but that sort of gives at least a, a ballpark. So clearly vaccination is a, you know, Preventive strategy um, has some cost benefits, but it's also uh, helpful to keep people out of the hospital um, with uh, remarkable efficacy. Um, so if patients do get sick, um, the, the resources spent on this for both preventing hospitalization and also improving the speed of recovery, um, we believe is uh, well worth it. And there's not many treatments that have this degree of efficacy and certainly not in COVID, um, but we will plan some cost analyses downstream as well. Closing remarks, 
hard to find treatments that are this effective. It's hard to also implement new treatments in general. We know normally, you know, maybe seven to 10 years, the DNI people on this call could probably comment more to get things into practice. And we're asking uh, to get this into practice in the matter of weeks um, or, you know, months um, with a changing tide and the roller coaster that Dr. Tape mentioned. And so uh, it's challenging. We're trying to get the information out and uh, try to have this be a, a key uh, pillar of our um, response to the uh, pandemic, including vaccination as well. Dr. Tepe? Um, I would just echo what Dr. Gindi said, that it is hard to find things that are this effective. And even though there's a lot of logistical changes with the ordering and everything, we are doing our best to make it accessible and get it out everywhere. <laughs> Dr. Connolly? Yes, and um, you know, I appreciate all that CDPH has done. And I don't think that the process is any more difficult than it was before. Just a few more steps added in there. And this is a, such a great treatment. And, um, and we're so lucky that it's available to our, our residents for both prophylactic and for treatment. And I think, I hope you say it, but what is it's why, why should I treat or why shouldn't I treat? <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate everyone's um, participation and thank you to all who have logged in. Uh, this will be recorded on our GREC uh, Grand Rounds website in case you'd like to share it with any colleagues. Um, and I think that we should <clears throat> meet again when uh, ProVent is out or uh, that trial is done because I think that also uh, causes lots of challenge in my thinking of, well, who might I give an IM uh, injection when uh, to prevent COVID, especially if I think they may be immunosenescent. So that, that's a whole nother story that we need data for. Thank you all for joining. Um, we appreciate it.